Welcome to the Sharkpreneur Podcast with Kevin Harrington and Seth Green. Kevin Harrington is the inventor of the infomercial, one of the original sharks from the hit TV show Shark Tank, and has generated over $5 billion in TV and digital direct response sales. Seth Green is the world's first trusted authority on cutting edge direct response marketing, a best selling author, and the only three time Marketer of the Year nominee. On the podcast, Kevin and Seth interview sharkpreneurs who share straight talk on what it takes to explode your business. Why do so many businesses struggle while others seem to explode overnight? Do you wish you had the secret to this type of exponential growth? Now, I've scaled more than 20 businesses to over $100 million, and it's not just luck. In my new book with Mark Tim, Mentor to Millions, you'll learn the repeatable framework I use in all my business ventures for massive success. Order at KevinMentor.com and get over $1,000 in bonuses. Head to KevinMentor.com. Welcome to the Sharkpreneur Podcast. This is your co-host, Seth Green. Joining me today is the inventor of the infomercial and the original shark on the hit TV series, Shark Tank, Kevin Harrington. Kevin, thanks so much for being here. Great to be here. Looking forward to our special guest today, Seth. Thank you. Yes, very, very special guest, Rich Sheffrin, who has coached some of the world's top online business gurus, increased his clients' revenues by billions, with a B, billions of dollars, grew multiple businesses to multiple seven figures a year, pretty much popularized online business coaching back in 2005, invented the first automated webinar in 2009, and the rest of his list of accolades could take the entire half hour. So we're going to skip that and dive right in. Rich, thanks so much for joining us. We're excited to be here. So you're on the forefront of cutting edge marketing, and you're kind of famous for being a strategic thinker of getting people, entrepreneurs and business owners away from chasing shiny objects and thinking like a strategic founder. So how have you been coaching folks and how have you been advising them to pivot during the pandemic? Yeah, well, I mean, you know, fortunately, most of the buyers went online during COVID. So across the board, uh, not because of any genius of my own or anything like that, just the way it is, all my clients had banner years in 2020. And, you know, I've, you know, I would imagine, Kevin, maybe you probably think the same way because I imagine like direct response kind of dictates yeah. this, but the, that I've often thought about like the way strategy is done these days, it's much more of an emergent process. It's much more of a sense and respond versus plan and execute. You can only plan out so far. And with things that change so fast and so dramatically, you have to kind of, you know, it's like kind of driving a car at night. You can only see so far in front of you, but you got to just confidently go in that direction, kind of know the trajectory, but you can't be attached to any single specific way to get there. Yeah. And one of the things I've said, and Rich, I'm sure you'll understand and know this very well, the households using television and the internet was skyrocketing because there was tens of millions of unemployed people sitting at home. At the same time, these restaurants and concert venues were not advertising. So you had this huge decline in advertisers, a huge increase in viewership which makes for great direct response, which is the business that we're in. So yeah, we, we were crushing it with most of our campaigns also. Yeah, I mean, one of the things, just to answer your question more directly, Seth, um, one of the things when it was appropriate, not wasn't necessarily appropriate for all businesses, was to start doing as many like Facebook Lives and things like that because Facebook was pushing it and people were bored at home. I'm talking about like, March, April, May, especially, I had a lot of clients that picked up a huge audience. I mean, we started live streaming twice a week. And I'd say within the first like three months, we had several million views. And it was, you know, and then later on, like when we launched something, we targeted all the people that like attended the live streams. And that was by far like the best converting group. And yeah, it was a unique time where people were sitting at home bored. And, you know, all you have to do is turn on a camera and you have an audience. Clubhouse kind of has that right now. I don't know if you guys have been on Clubhouse, but, uh, you know, Max and I actually, Maxwell Finn and I did a call like because like he's got a new baby and we haven't had a chance to talk. So he's like, hey, do you want to get on Clubhouse together and we can just talk on Clubhouse? I was like, yeah, sure. It was the first time I got on Clubhouse and uh, that was like two weeks ago. 
and um, Maxwell set up a room, a marketers talking about marketing to marketers and stuff. And before, like, before we even had more than a few sentences, we probably had like 200 or 300 people in that room, you know, which like now it'd be probably more difficult to get 200 or 300 people just turning on the camera with Facebook Live, whereas like Clubhouse within the first five minutes, we had that audience. So it's yeah. interesting, like how, you know, people jump from from platform to platform. Yeah, I, I opened on. a room last night at 8 p.m. It's still open. I, I did about five hours on Clubhouse. It's like there's a plus side to that and a minus side, you know, because my wife is like, wait, wait a minute, <laughs> what's going on here tonight? Yeah. yeah, I mean, we're both obviously <laughs> on it. I couldn't believe it when it was, I said as a joke, I was going to go on Christmas Day because we're Jewish and we don't care. Right. And right. all of a sudden there were all these people and I'm like, aren't you opening presents with your kids? Like, why are you talking to me? I just did it because I, I was gonna be out for five minutes figuring no one would show up. Why do you think that is, Rich? Why do you think this, and it's audio only, there's no visual, it's basically like a party line conference call. Why right. do you think that's catching on so fast? Well, so there's two things there, right? So on the why I think it's catching on so fast is that right now, like at least in the marketing community, but it seems like it's pervasive, there's so many people jumping on and they're sharing great stuff. But the thing is, is that, you know, if you leave, there's no record. So you, that you can't capture, although someone has uh, clubhousenotes.com or get clubhousenotes.com. I, I saw that and I bought it just to see like what kind of stuff was being dropped. But there is this like fear of missing out like with it. And it has that viral component with the, you know, with alerts, like actually I'm going to do a clubhouse room with Jay Abraham, I think tomorrow night. And I got Jay to install it on his phone. And then like, you know, he called me oh, back. Like, he always calls later. me from his landline. Like yeah, I he called me an hour later. He's like, how do I stop all these alerts? Like I'm getting alerted every two minutes about a room. Like, what is this? Right. Um, so there's <laughs> that, but there's actually something, you know, something that I've like, I've been fascinated with my whole life. And I just wonder, Kevin, like if you have any thoughts about this, because it's, you know, it definitely dovetails into you as well. Like as a student of direct response, right? What I've noticed is that every big breakthrough in direct response, more often than not, came from a change of format. Back in the old days, like when we did Magalogs, yeah. crazy increase in response. When we did VSLs, yeah. like, you know, at Agora, it was like 300 to 400% across the board, like increase in response. Nowadays, it's the same, like, you know, it's even webinars, same, right? Like, so there's always like, whenever there's a new format that direct response advertisers can jump on, yeah. it seems, especially if it's like kind of stealth, like people don't realize they're being sold to at the very beginning, right? Like, right? There seems to be like an explosion and I would put infomercials in there as well, right? Yeah, like when it was a sure. new format, it was probably easier than ever to sell like in the beginning, was it? And like, do you see anything like that in your neck of the woods? Like, you and, know, you know, I'll, I'll say this, I think, yes, I, I, you know, infomercial wise, early eighties, I'm watching my 30 channels and the last channel was discovery and it was only an 18 hour a day channel. And I called the cable company and said, can I put something on those other six hours? But we did that for years and years and years and years. And, you know, it built an industry with not a lot of changes other than, yeah, media rates did go up a little. But the challenge in today's world, something hits and yeah. you get a jump, but they're quick to modify it because they're not going to let you get that jump for too long, right? I mean, right. what is Facebook going to do? If they think you're getting a jump, they're going to change the algorithms, right? right. So um, it'll be interesting. I got on the, we've had over 700 DM messages from our session in the last 20, in the last 18 hours. And I'm just like blown away that, you know, where, how else do you just go live? And there's, you know, we had thousands on our thing at the, at the peak, 2,700 or something, but 700 of them have reached out for, you know, for looking for some personal advice or help or whatever. And so, yes, at some point, there's going to be a monetization that will be happening on the clubhouse side. I'm not sure how that's going to work, whether you got to pay to get into a room or whatever, right. but there will be some changes within the next 60 or 90 days, I'll bet you. Yeah, as soon as marketers figure out a way to monetize, we beat the shit out of it until like we get pushed out of the platform. Yeah. That's generally the way it works. I'll and pay that, you, you know, for a shout out in your room. Yeah, yeah the um, you know, and actually, like I did this uh, event back in February that was like anti big tech, and part of the reason like we did that was that these big platforms really are don't have entrepreneurs' best interests in mind, and the the thing that sparked it. 
the most recent thing that sparked it back in February was that in January, like Google hit a threshold where now then, so now even more, more than 51% of the traffic that goes to Google search doesn't leave Google. Like, so they scrape everyone's content. They're using our content to get people to come and do a search. Mm -hmm. And the old rules of search engine were like people search and then they go to the site. So yeah, you can scrape my content because like visitors are going to come. But with the answer box, with moving people to YouTube, with like now all of a sudden, you know, less than half are actually going out, which means that Google's just using your content, you know, for visitors and everything else. And, you know, that's just the, the tip of the spear, so to speak, as yeah. far as big businesses goals, which are very often in conflict with small business. Hey, Rich, I have a question. So 15 yeah. years ago, you were a pioneer in this in the world of coaching. And so to be a coach, you obviously had to have a lot of great experience. Tell me a little bit about the early days of Rich Sheffern, you know, growing up in some of your early deals. Yeah. So I'll pepper some really quick things that <laughs> unfortunately we just don't have time to go into, but right. they're interesting. So my dad was a sociopath, my mom, a narcissist. So I had a very interesting childhood, had lots of trauma and stuff like that. But oh, wow. when I was 13 or 14, I don't remember the age now, ran away from home, uh, spent a lot of time with the guys that were in the book, Wise Guys, which is what Goodfellas was based on, but they didn't make it into the movie. These guys fixed horse races. They paid number five out of the eight jockeys not to come in first or second or third. So Nobody knew who was going to come in first and second, third, but five jockeys knew that they were not. And then they would bet, you know, all the different combinations and they, surprise, surprise, they did really well. So I ran away from home and I actually was a gopher for like one of the guys that was involved in that for about a year and a half until one day my dad walked into my room while I was counting about 20 grand on my desk. This was when I was <laughs> like 14 or 15. And so that was the end of that. Yeah. Then I got a job in high school and the job in high school that I had that was Jordan Belford's first job as a stockbroker. So oh. in high school, I was just uh, doing direct mail actually for them. And Jordan had just gone bankrupt in his meat business. Hmm. Like in the movie, The Wolf of Wall Street, I don't think this guy ever existed. <laughs> like I was in a real office building, but like in that movie, they make it look like a strip mall where everyone's like surrounds him when he's pitching on the phone. Right. And uh, so I got to watch Jordan for a year and he really was that good. Everyone else was like on a three call system and he was on a one call system and he'd come in for two hours a day, close like four people and then leave and then paste his commission checks on his wall so that everyone could see how much more he was making than everyone right. else. He hasn't so, changed, anyway, has he? <laughs> no, I don't think he's changed. I don't know him that well anymore, but I knew him well when I was 16. But uh, yeah, so the interesting childhood. Anyway, went to study accounting in college, dropped out my senior year to take over a business that was a failing clothing store. Turned that clothing store around. It became like the hot store in Manhattan and uh, like at pretty much every celebrity like shop there. It's like if you're familiar with California, it was like Fred Siegel's of Cali like in gotcha. California. We were oh, the yeah. equivalent. And um, yep. then we started our own, we started licensing music. We were like the first store to do that. It's pretty common nowadays. That did so well that I then built a recording studio right in the middle of the store. Mm -hmm. And um, this was when electronic music was becoming really popular. So, and mm -hmm. ours was electronic music. So sure. that launched a music label and that did pretty decent. Then after a few years, I decided I had enough of all of that, got out of those businesses, took a year or two off and got hypnotized and I'm highly hypnotizable. So then I decided I wanted to do a business in that. And when I started that business, I thought like, you know, I was still in my twenties, but I had had like two big successes and I thought I really got marketing. And when I started advertising for the hypnosis center, the more I liked the ad, the worse it did, right? Like, cause now it was about the phone ringing, not about like creating an image or creating like, you know, a concept. And so that quickly then made me realize that there was a whole form of advertising I didn't know, didn't even know existed called direct response. And so that like, I started studying copywriting without really even knowing what it was in the beginning. And then eventually that led me to Dan Kennedy, Gary Halpert, Jay yep. Abraham, and like internalized all their stuff. And then ultimately did a thing with Jay. I was a client of his and then it went sideways. I owed him a bunch of money. He thought he was never going to see it. And then I paid him back like a couple months later and he was surprised that he got paid, right? Because I guess when people bad debt in like coaching type things generally don't turn out to be good. 
And uh, Jay just kept the door open for me and said, if you ever are doing anything interesting, call me back. Like, you know, there's not that many honest people out there. So I went online, started learning stuff online. And as I started learning stuff online, I then reached out to Jay once I had kind of established myself and started doing well and brought Jay online. We did a like, you know, coaching programs and some teleseminars. And then from there, having coached with Jay, Oh, and then while I was in college, also, I took a year off and I worked for Arthur Anderson and Anderson Consulting. So I had <laughs> that kind of experience. And I would say that probably like, you know, Jay teaches this all the time, but I don't think it, I don't think it lands as probably as deeply as it could based on what he, Jay is saying. Jay talks about, you know, a concept in one industry has the power of an atomic bomb or a strategy in one industry has the power of an atomic bomb in another. What people don't realize is that Jay did that himself. Like Jay took all the principles of direct response and he brought it to the entrepreneurial market. And that was new to the entrepreneurial market when he brought it there. Since Jay is one of my mentors, like, you know, it worked for him. Like I figured why not? It worked for me. So I took all the stuff that I learned from Anderson Consulting and Arthur Anderson and brought it to the entrepreneurial market as well. Like, you know, project management, process mapping, all this kind of stuff that at that time nobody really knew about. And I was very fortunate too. So I did this presentation at the very last event that like of the last coaching program that Jay and I were doing at that time. And this was more luck than anything else. The, the people who my message resonated with, because I was talking to a room of marketers, right? So the only yeah. people that, that like this idea of being overwhelmed and having too much opportunity and not really knowing how to do, like how to manage that and really exploit those opportunities the people were people who were already somewhat advanced in their marketing skill, but their business skill was less than their marketing skill. So if you can imagine coaching 25 companies who already had marketing chops, but their operational stuff was preventing them from growing, which mm-hmm. is not typical business, right. Typical, right? Like typical business, the marketing, generally operations can handle whatever marketing can deliver. Yeah. Uh, in these particular cases, it wasn't. So one of the reasons why I you know, was able to create like, crazy successes, like for pretty much all my clients was that really the clients were self-selecting based on like, my marketing skill is much better than my operational skills. Can you help me? And that's yeah, you the formed, problem you formed quite a coalition with Jay. You also have another one that broke all kinds of records in 2020. Talk a little bit real quick before we, before we let you go about the coalition to save the internet. Yeah. Before that though, like even just, I brought, I saw John Benson invented the, the VSL. And right. I saw that the very first week that he like put it out on ClickBank. And I was like, holy shit, this is going to work. And I immediately showed it to Mark Ford, who's one of the co-owners of Agora. And he's like, yeah, this will work. We can take control of the selling. Like they can't advance. Like, you know, he, we'd already seen in the like, you know, in heat maps, like where people's attention was going and they go scroll down to the bottom, look at price, right? Like you could prevent that from happening with a VSL. And immediately, like Agora jumped by 300 to 400%, right? And Mm -hmm. that's kind of an underscore underline of the whole idea of like, when something works in one industry, it can work incredibly well in lots of industries. And the idea is to hop on it sooner. So yeah, so I did this, I did a 24 hour live stream back in 2008, which I did completely by myself, just answering questions for 24 hours. We did a 24 hour live stream this February, this past February in 2020. This time I didn't do it by myself. I did it with like pretty much a who's who of online marketing. And the gist of it was to launch this program that I have, which is called Steal Our Winners, which basically each month delivers tactics that nobody knows about that are currently working, right? From the list of the people that were there, plus a whole bunch more. We have about 100 different contributors. And um, the whole idea of it, though, was that it's going to be get, get more difficult for online business as Google, as Facebook, and as Amazon uh, make it best in their best interest, which is generally not in the best interest of uh, small business. And yeah. so I specialize really in small business. That's what I love. I love helping beginners. I'm unlike a lot of my peers, I guess. They do not like beginners, but I like beginners all the way up to about a 20 to $30 million business is really my sweet spot. Hey, Rich, do, do yeah. you take, do you get involved with equity stakes with, with clients? Sometimes, of yours? Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, yeah I mean, that, I mean, if you're yeah. going to create a hundred million dollar business, it'd be nice to own a piece of that too, right? Yeah. 
Yep, I've done that a few times and that's worked out pretty well. And then I did this for a while. I did this with Jay for a while. Then I did it alone for a while where we had this coaching program that was a million dollar coaching program. But the way it worked was people would put down like a $50,000 retainer and that bought them like six months. And the idea was, is that when it was Jay and I, it was Jay and I, when it was me, it was just me. But uh, we get 4% of the increase in gross until the millions paid off. And mm. we have to be getting a check by the time like six months happens or that 50,000 has been eaten up. Right. And, right. Uh, and then after that, people can decide whether they want to renew after they've paid the million. Right. And so did it a few times with Jay. Um, and then I did it on my own. And then uh, I still have a few clients that have renewed a couple of times and that's kind of nice. But uh, yeah, I certainly in the very beginning, I'm, I helped a lot of people make millions and millions of dollars and I got paid like $3,000 to coach them, um, <laughs> which kind of sucked in certain ways, but it was great too, because like if they were willing to share their story, I ended up getting a lot more people too. And the, that goodwill will come back to yes. you over, over time, which it has, I'm sure. So yeah, we know uh, your time is incredibly valuable. We greatly appreciate you joining us today. For folks who are watching or listening and want to learn more about Steal Our Winners, um, which I am a thrilled member of. Where is the best place for them to go to learn more about Steal Our Winners and about you? Well, it's kind of hidden. So uh, what I would say is that our website is strategicprofits.com. That's pretty easy to find. I don't know where it is on our website at the moment, but if they put forward slash rich, R-I-C-H, my name, right? Uh, it will take them to a Steal Our Winners promo of some sort. Um, awesome. but, uh, but there's a lot of good stuff on the blog. I've also written a tremendous amount of free reports that are either on my site or also just out there. And um, they're still as valid today. And I would recommend that people read them. Awesome. Sure. This has been Seth Green hey, with Rich. Kevin Harrington and Rich. Good Seth hanging Green. out with you, buddy. Uh, Very nice hanging out. Grab a lunch you. sometime. We're both in Florida. Let's do it. Okay. I would love that. It would be an sure. honor. You too. Take care. Happy Thanks New Year. Ever. Thanks Happy everybody New. for watching or listening. We'll see you next time. Do you need money to fund your idea, product, or service? Are you ready to take your business to the next level, but need capital to get it done? Kevin Harrington has heard more than 50,000 pitches and knows how to help you make the perfect pitch to get the funding for your entrepreneurial dream. He's distilled the process down in his perfect pitch cheat sheet and it's yours for free. Just text pitch to him right now at 727-888-2100. Text pitch to 727-888-2100 right now and claim your free perfect pitch cheat sheet. Text PITCH to 727-888-2100 to start funding your dream today. This show has been produced by Market Domination, LLC. To discover how you can have your own show completely done for you and turn it into a real published book and become the authority in your marketplace, go to www.marketdominationllc.com slash podcast offer.